I'm not even trained for combat. My safety! How do I turn the safety off of my weapon? Ooh, talking about having a bad day. Being thrust into war without being properly trained. Now that's not good. <laughs> Praise God. Welcome to another episode from Inside Out Ministries, where God wants to change you from inside out. I'm Minister Hugh Braxton, a.k.a. Eugene Preacher, with another KISS episode. We like to keep it super simple. Welcome to my gym. That would be God, you, and me. <laughs> Praise God. God is in the house. Praise God. Hey, you know, as a believer, sometimes we're not properly trained sometimes, and we can have, like, bad days like that. Let me give you an example you think is a bad day. I mean, I mean, sometimes people get a bad report from a doctor. Sometimes, you know, your finances is not right. That's not good. That's not kingdom. That's not what God wants you to have. As a child of God, you have rights as a citizen of the kingdom of God, and that's what I'm talking about today in this episode. You know, Jesus assured us that we could be overcomers. He says, do not fear the world because I have overcome the world. So therefore, you don't have to worry about this, but you need to learn how to be an overcomer. And that's what this episode is about, about you being properly training, meaning henceforth, I'm bringing bring you back to the basics, but in kingdom training, that is. And I was trained in Christianity, but I never was trained in the kingdom. So therefore, I want to teach you how to uh, get everything that God has already laid out before the foundation of the earth with your name written all over it. It's yours. As they say, it's your birthday. It's yours. Okay, enough for that. But I just want to let you know, God got something good for you. We serve a good God if you're a believer. If not, I invite you to come and get part of this citizenship called the kingdom of God by accepting what the son did on the cross. We're going to talk a lot in this episode. There's going to be several series. We're going to teach you how to properly pray. You know, what, what do you do when you get a bad report? How do you respond with that? How about marriage, marriage life? How about finances? Hey, that'll get you going. Relationships. God already has the answer in his constitution called the Bible, basic instruction for you leave earth. And this episode, I'm telling you, this is the one I've been waiting for to really get out to God's people to let them know how you can live a victorious life. I know you've heard it over and over again without having the victory. Well, maybe you're starting from the wrong position. And that's why we got to go, what? Back to basic training. We got to get our training on. You haven't been trained. God says training the way a child should go. Well, I'm going to behave myself. But these are some of the scriptures we're going to take a look at how God took training very seriously. But we must be properly trained and prepped for battle. You know, your battles now, don't get me wrong, you don't war against flesh and blood. We know about that in my other series I taught you. But you war in the invisible realms, principalities. You know, Satan is the ruler of this world. If you've seen my other series on Spirit Man Part 1 and 2, you need to go check that out. Let you know that there's another person who's trying to ruin your life. You have an adversary. You have a devil. You have, And he's using people, places, things, music, movies, food, everything to attack and destroy. Destroy you messing with your mind. It's battlefield of the mind. Let's go. Let's go into this new series that we will be going back to the basics and teach you how to train and how to trouble your trouble. Now, you know, get your Bibles because we're going to be in the Word of God. Jesus used the Word against Satan, and we're going to use the Word against Satan, but we're going to do it right, rightly dividing the Word of God. Let's go back to basic, basic instructions before leave the earth. Come on. Okay, you ready to go? Here we go. Now, I have to tell you about my little experience about training. Something that I'm really, I really love is training. You know, after being 20 years in military service, I realized one thing I like the most is my experience 
in training preparation and training to complete my mission you know i always knew what i had to do you know even if it was difficult at least i knew how to do it you know sometimes believers man you know people tell you you know that you should be doing this and you should be doing that nothing used to frustrate me the most is when people tell me where i should be and what i should have but nobody taught me how to do it so this is where i come in i'm a teacher and i love teaching and instructing people because i know you don't know you want to do it but you don't know how to do it because nobody come alongside you and teach you well it's all written in the bible and i like to teach the why and the how of the bible most people teach the what the who and the what i like to teach the why and the how and in the why you go back to god's original plan which was going to bring you right back to a kingdom and not religion praise god but like I said, after 20 years in military service, man, that was the most thing that I really enjoyed about how they always instructed you to do something, uh, your mission to complete it, but they always gave you the right instructions to do it. And then they will hold you accountable. A very disciplined organization. Loved it. Starting in basic training. That's the first place everybody goes. You know, you get some highly motivated people who will make sure that you are motivated and trained for your task. And matter of fact, they used to always say, the stuff I'm teaching you might save your life one day. True, and the stuff that I'm teaching you might save your life also, or have a better life, or a Zoe type of life, or a God kind of life, or a kingdom citizen life. This is the kind of stuff I want to teach you. You know, basic training is basically was like the doorway uh, to the military. You know, just like civilians go in, and then soldiers come out all right you know what what in the kingdom of god a god system he has the same thing sinners go in and sons and daughters come out you know same system that's why when i seen it when i you know i just got in church and stuff and after being in the military i realized like wait, wait man and i started reading the bible I'm like man god's system is just like the military it's highly trained you're supposed to train yourself and get yourself prepared you know and fight these battles against the kingdom of darkness and you have the kingdom of light which i am on so how did that you know praise god but you know basic training lies at the foundation of effective training for a fighting force so therefore each soldier has to pass through it to earn the uniform henceforth i got a model one on right now um, but just like in the military or, you know, the forces to earn a uniform, you don't have to earn it for God. I get in God's system. All you have to do is just sign up by saying, I accept Jesus. And guess what kind of uniform you get? You get this invisible robe of righteousness. That's what God says. Okay, now you are now belong to me. But you have to be trained. <laughs> We're going to talk about, okay, now that I'm not enjoying God's forces, what do I do? Now you have to be trained. Let's look at this next. Come on. Now, one thing I do realize is that Jesus was the master teacher. He took his time to actually develop and train the disciples. You know, he used the show and tell message. He was always out there preaching and then he'd turn around and demonstrate, you know. Um, just like we used to do in elementary school, show and tell that, you know, got up there all nervous and did your thing. But praise God. You know, the United States uh, has about five branches of armed forces that they use to protect their country. They have the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, the Marines, and the United States Coast Guard. Well, God has his own boot camp too and his own forces. It's called the Fivefold Ministry. The Fivefold Ministry it consists of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And these guys were set in the body, you know, to teach, you know, and boot camp and train to help us renew our mind, you know, just like they do in the United States Forces. They have their own boot camp. Their job is to teach us and train us and equip us to do the work of the ministry to help you deal with issues when you get bad reports you know to show you how to trouble your trouble you know that's what they're supposed to do you know praise god now we also have a commander you probably never knew this but our god is called jehovah gabar that is the mighty man of war in psalms 24 and 8 david always referred to him he's like god teach my hands the war you do have to fight we don't fight against flesh and blood again it's a spiritual battle We're normally between our ears but we also have to say some things and do some things and lay some hands on some things you know and that's your battle and you're troubling what you're troubling is circumstances you're supposed to dominate your circumstances you know about authority from our other series God has given us dominion. Let them have dominion. Let them have authority over the birds, the air, the seas, you know, everything that's material, even your own sick body. Tell it to get in line. You got, you have. Okay, let's take a look at the word train before we even get into the scriptures. The word train means to teach, to farm, to practice, to educate, to exercise, 
to discipline as to train a military, a militia, whatever, you know. So let's look at some word right now. First Timothy chapter four, verse seven reads like this. Do not waste time arguing with a great word over godless ideas or old wives tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Yes, you have to train yourself to be godly. That's why we have the fivefold ministry. You must train to make sure you are being trained to be godly. Let's look at another scripture. 1 Timothy 4 and 8. Physical training is good. Now don't forget that. Physical training exercise is good, God says. But training for godliness is much better. But training for godliness is much better, God says. He didn't say Training the physical body was bad. Most people kind of use that excuse not to exercise. That ain't going to work for you. Praise God. But, you know, God, training for godliness is much better. It says promise and benefits. Why? In this life and after. Praise God. <laughs> you get the double for your trouble when you train yourself to be godly. Praise God. Let's look at another scripture. Look at, look at Titus chapter 2 verse 4. That they may train the young women to love their husbands and to love their children. See, me and my wife love premarital counseling because this is something that you need. You need to learn to be trained. You need to be trained. Go to a school. Five-fold ministry should be doing it. If not, find somebody who will teach you to train the young women how to love their husbands and love their children. And don't forget, you got scriptures for men to be trained. Love your Wife as Christ loved the church. That's a training within himself. You have to be trained to do that. That don't come naturally. You just can get your high school sweetheart and just automatically start doing this stuff. And just as long as we love each other, you know, everything will be fine. Yeah, that's why we got 52% divorce rate. Because you got into something that you what? You was not training. You like that guy <laughs> thrust into battle without training. Praise God. Let's look at another one. Proverbs 22 and 6. It says this. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. See? Train. Okay. Let's look at why is God so concerned about training? You know, of all things. He's God. Why are you worried about training? Let's take a look at this verse. One of my favorite verses, by the way, to help me get an insight about why God wants us to be informed about everything. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 says it this way. He says, my people are destroyed. Why? For a lack of knowledge. He says, you're not trained. You don't know. Watch this. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. That you shall not be a priest for me. Now, here's God. This is the Old Testament thing with God going off on a priest. And the priest was part of, like you said, the fivefold ministry back then, uh, where they actually have to teach and instruct the people God's ways and God's word, how to worship, how to hear from God, what God desires of them. They were their job to teach him. Now, he's saying, he's telling the priest, you know, my people are getting destroyed right now because you're not teaching them what I told him to teach you. He says, and you're rejecting what I tell you to tell them. And he says, but I'm going to reject you also because you're making my people destroyed. See, God's really concerned about you being trained. You have to be trained properly. That's why you have to go to church. That's what it's supposed to be for. It's supposed to be a place where you go and renew your mind. Not just the fellowship and have a good time, drink mocha choco chocolates, okay? You need to go and get some word. Get some word in your head. Okay. We see that the priest job was to actually train the people. And if they didn't train the people, what happened to the people? Well, the people were destroyed. Just like people you know who go buy their first house, buy their first car. You're not trained. Go and get married. You're not trained. What happened? You wind up destroying and making a bad deal. <laughs> Eat in the marriage, house, car, whatever. You get a bad deal because you weren't trained. You got to get trained. <laughs> Praise God. So the priest wasn't doing it. So instead of the priest teaching, you know, the people, uh, true doctrine and true man of worship they start talking them false doctrine and false worship and superstitions all kind of stuff idolatry the people got into idolatry and people said now nah, my people are being destroyed and he got mad at the instructors and says your job is to make sure they're well trained you know we all are teachers we all instructors if you got kids you automatically go there so make sure you train the child the way it should go and that way is through the bible basic instruction before they leave the earth praise God let's continue 
Okay, we know that our God, our Father in heaven is real serious about being, making sure that his people is well equipped and well trained so much that in Hosea 4 and 6, he fires somebody. He says, I reject you. <laughs> you're out of here. My people are paraphrasing because you're not training them. And if you are training, you're training the wrong thing. Now, let's look at some of today's teaching. I've just listed a couple of some of today's teaching that's very popular of what you're hearing and making sure that we're being properly trained anyway. But all of them are great and good. Let me say that right off the bat. But let's take a look at them. It says, today you hear stuff like the gospel or the person of Jesus. Now, the gospel just needs one thing. It means the good news. The good news of the person of Jesus or the gospel of the person of Jesus. Excellent. He's the main guy that we have to get to. All right. The gospel of grace and salvation. Very popular. Always has been. Always will be. Um, the gospel of born again. You know, back in the 70s, that was real big too. But you're still, you know, still very important. The gospel of heaven or the good news of heaven. The gospel of faith. The gospel of healing. The gospel of miracles. We got all kinds of stuff that we hear, you know, even the gospel of music. You know, so the good news, the good news of all that stuff. Now, let's take a look and see what in Jesus' day, what were they preaching? They should have been preaching in the same ballpark, right? Let's take a look. Okay. Let's take a look at first the forerunner. As soon as you get to the, the Gospels, you know, about Jesus, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to run into this guy right here called John the Baptist. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. And uh, he was the forerunner for Jesus. He was announcing, just like they do, you see, da -da 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 -da, here come the king. Well, basically, that was John's job, job. And he just started mentioning and saying these certain things. So let's look at the scriptures of Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, and see what John was talking about, about the forerunner, because he's also a teacher. He's a preacher. John the Baptist or Presbyterian or whatever you want to call him. Praise God. <laughs> All right. Let's look and read the scriptures. In verse 1, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness in Judea, saying, meaning he's preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. It's come near you. Praise God. Let's take a look at what Jesus says. Now let's read verse Matthew chapter 4. We're still in the book of Matthew chapter 4. Let's look at verse 17. It says, now from that time on, Jesus began to preach. Now that time on means after he got you being tempted in the wilderness, after he got baptized, you know, by John the Baptist and the skies opened up saying, this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased. Well, then Jesus went to the wilderness to be tested, you know, by Satan, passed the test. And then now we come here, he says, and from that time on, God began, to, Jesus began to preach repent same stuff for the kingdom of heaven is near here we go again he's repeating john so him and john are on the court they're preaching the same message they're talking about repent you know and repent means to rethink uh you know the way your way of thinking all the way you are actually going you turn away around you I mean you walk in this way and you turn around and go the other direction that's what god says you need to repent even when he forgives you of your sins he says cool you're cleansed you're forgiven now stop going that way and go this way. Real simple to me. I got it. Praise God. <laughs> now you know that Jesus had 12 disciples on him. So what did he teach them to teach? Let's see what he told them. Let's go to Luke chapter 9 verses 1 and 2 and see what they were saying. The 12 disciples. The 12 now. It's now when Jesus had called the 12 together. Oh look at here. And he gave them the power and the authority to drive out demons and cure diseases. He gave them the power to do this. Look at here. And now verse 2. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about what? The kingdom of God and heal the sick. Look at here. Here's Jesus telling the same disciples the same message. Except John them said they referred to the kingdom of heaven, which is the overall boot of the whole thing. And then he tell the disciples, now you go out and preach the kingdom of God is here also as you go out and heal the sick. So when they're getting healed, he says, now the kingdom of God is here. I'm letting you know what's up. Now you might not know, like, what in the world is the kingdom of God? What's the kingdom of heaven? What's the difference? That's why I'm doing this teaching. You know I'm going to not leave you hanging like that. But I must prove my point. See what they were teaching. See what we're teaching. And see where we're going with this. Let's get some more. I, if I was to talk about all the time that Jesus mentioned the kingdom of God, we would be here forever. So I pulled out this one scenario in Luke that I wanted to show you um, how what was going on. You know, as Jesus was going down healing and people uh, follow him, you know, people want to join his band. They seen the 12 disciples there and Jesus trying to let you know, like, hold up before you 
decide you want to follow us, you might want to check yourself. It's like sign up in the military. When I signed up in the military, you know, everybody's like, you know, you find up in, in Air Force, you can sign up for four or six. And people are like, man, I, I'm thinking about if I don't know if I'm going to sign up because I'm gonna be, my life's going to belong to them. Sound familiar? Your life belongs to God when you sign up with Jesus. Same stuff. That's why I love the military. And it's the same way in the kingdom of God, the same type of structure. Let's take a look at the scripture. Okay. Look at Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. We're going to take our time and read through it before I can paint this picture. Here we go. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Verse 58, Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Verse 59, he said to another man, Follow me. Um, but he replied, Lord, first let me go home and bury my father. Verse 60, Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and what? Proclaim the kingdom of God. Let me park it right there real quick on verse 60. I mean, here's Jesus saying the most important part is not burying your father, but proclaiming the kingdom of God. Let the dead bury the dead. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's a strong statement. But I'm showing you how important the kingdom of God was to Jesus. And watch, look at verse 59. Uh, I'm not going to get to that. We'll go to that another time. Praise God. Verse 60, 61. Let's take a look at it. Still another one said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Now, here's Jesus with a strong rebuke. Verse 62. But Jesus told him, Anyone who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Wow, what a strong statement. Let's let you know that Jesus was very serious about this subject, the kingdom of God. This is why I'm teaching this series on back to the kingdom of God because it was very important to him. So therefore, it needs to be very important to us if we are followers of Christ. Praise God. Let's continue. Okay, so far we've seen that John the Baptist preached about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Jesus preached about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And the twelve disciples preached about what? The kingdom of God. None of them talk about grace and none of the stuff that we heard so far in our modern day preaching. But they stayed on one subject. Let's take a look. In Luke chapter 10 verses 1 and 2 and then verse 9, we're going to look at Jesus Commission 70. Two, let's check it out. Verse 1, it says this. Luke chapter 10, verse 1 says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others, other than the 12, <laughs> and he sent them out two by two to every town and place where he was about to go. So here we go. Jesus took another 72 guys, commissioned them as his disciples, and sent them out two by two to go into the cities and as his 12 took their time in the city that these guys are like the forerunner going there. And let's look at verse 2 and see what he had them do. Once you get there, what did they have to do? He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out more workers and for the harvest to fill. Now, that's a very serious statement. That was back, what, 2,000 years ago? God said the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. I mean, if we haven't picked that fruit, that fruit is rotten. And that's why we see our world fall apart right now. Because it's rotten fruit out there, you know. And we need more harvesters. The right harvest. But God says, don't let you go out there and start doing your own thing. He says, go to the Father. You know, go to the harvest. You know, go ask the Lord of the harvest. The Lord, who's the Lord? The Lord means owner. So the owner of the harvest, you know, you need to go ask the Lord. Lord, how do I reach them? <laughs> Basically, that's what he's telling you. You need to find out a way, a creative way, how to reach your type of people, the people that you run with and people that you can understand. Like a doctor's, you know, a doctor say you should reach the doctors that say, you know, construction workers should reach construction workers. You know, if you're a sport athlete, player, professional, whatever, you will reach those. That's how it's supposed to work. You know, you're not supposed to say, will you come to my church and hear my pastor? No, you do it. Remember, Jesus commissioned them. You go out and do it. See? Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Not, well, come to my church. <laughs> now, the church has its place. It's a university. It's a school. I went to college. I have degrees. But I have to go out to the world now and make it happen. And that's the way the church is. Enough of that. Before I digress, we got so much stuff to learn. Let's go to verse 9. Let's drop down to verse 9. Remember, Luke chapter 10, verse 9. And here's what he told them to do. You know, after he prayed to the, uh, the, the Lord of the harvest, he says, now this is what I want you to do when you get there. Heal the sick who are there and tell them this. What? The kingdom of God has come near you. 
There they go. Now we got the 72 saying the same thing. All these guys are on one accord saying the same message. You mean you're not talking about, you know, that Jesus, hey, he came, he's the one that you read in the Old Testament, he's going to go to the cross and die for you one day? You would think that Jesus commissioned and tell these guys, when you convince everybody, like, he's the Messiah, he's the one. No, not even. He had them preaching one message, the kingdom of God. And that's what I'm going to preach to you today, the kingdom of God. Praise God. Let's continue. All right. Now, I know some well-meaning person out there might be saying, yeah, brother, I understand all that. Yeah, they might have talked about the kingdom of God. But that was before the cross. Well, let's take a look. You know, I'm going to stay in the Word. Let's see what the Word says about that. Now, let's drop you with another guy called the Apostle Paul. You know, Paul was not part of the original 12. So it, afterwards, Paul was commissioned to preach the gospel, the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God, to the Gentiles. That would be you and I. We're not Jewish, all right? We're not Jewish people. We're the people that called out ones that God has picked outside the Jewish nation, all right? Even though we got a lot of people we support the Jews, love, they're our brothers, all that in the bag of chips. But I can never be a natural-born Jew. I can be a spiritual Jew, as they say, you know, whatever you want to call it. But our job is to be a Gentile. I am from the Gentile nation. Also, Paul was commissioned to reach the Gentile nation. All right, let's look at Acts 19, verse 8, and see what Paul had to say about what was his message then. He's preaching to the Gentiles. This is after the cross, all right? In Acts, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months. Now, this dude, and three months he's preaching. What, he had to change his message. He had to talk about grace. He had to talk about cross. He had to talk about, you know, salvation, miracle. Oh, no, let's see. Verse 9, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, arguably and persuasively about what? The kingdom of God. You mean to tell me this dude arguing for three months about one message? The kingdom of God. This is a very serious message, guys. I'm telling you. That's why I'm so excited about it. I've been alluded to in all my videos. Now, this is the one I've been really wanting to get to to get to understand because it opened my life up and opened the Bible up because the Bible is nothing about the kingdom of God. It's not about any type of religion. You know, Satan loves religion. Because what? It keeps the word. It makes the word of no effect. Your religion and your tradition makes the word of no effect. That's what Jesus told the Pharisees. Now, Okay, let's go to Acts 20, 24 and see what Paul had to say. Acts 20, Acts chapter 20, verse 24 and 25. Verse 24 says this, But my life is worth nothing to me unless I it is finishing the work that I was assigned to by the Lord Jesus Christ. What was that work? Let's leave. He says the work uh, that of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Now, that got your grace message. He says, now, Paul did preach grace, continue talking to people about grace. And most of the time, we talk to the Jews about that because they was always trying to bring an old system with a new. And Paul was supposed to be for the Gentiles, but since he was a Jew, he's like, what about my people? What about my people? You know, he kept running back over there. And that's why you see most of the argument all the time is about, he had to keep telling about the grace of God and he must preach the cross, you know, because, you know, and God crucified because they kept saying, no, but Moses told us in the law that we, we was righteous by this, you know. So that's when he talked to him. But the Gentiles, he had to have the conversation. He just started talking about the good news of the kingdom of God and roll with it. Why? Because they had no system. They were like me, you know. I had no system, no way. I wasn't thinking about no land. I'm on that, and I was thinking about tomorrow. And last night I painted the town red. Tomorrow I'm painted blue. You know, <laughs> so when you talk to Gentiles, you're gonna have these kind of conversations. They're just gonna roll with. It. Matter of fact, they were so free the whole time. We had to hold back the rain. It's like, you mean I'm good to go? God has saved me, man. In Corinthians and stuff, these people going down doing their old lifestyle. He's like, whoa, no, you're a new preacher. Don't do that no more. <laughs> That's how free they was. But you can tell the tone of Paul when he's talking to a Jew because he always arguing about the old law and all those. I mean, we're not in that. You a Gentile. Oh, you just found out about this, the whole point, that I didn't even know there was a law. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Let's look at verse 25 and see what he has to say about this. Now, I know that none of you among me whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. He preached the kingdom. In that same verse, verse 24, he talks about the grace of God, and he says, I also preached the kingdom. Let's continue. What else has Paul been up to? Because remember, he wrote a lot of letters to a lot of different churches with a lot of different circumstances and situations that you might fall in one or two of the category. But remember, these were letters, you know. It wasn't meant to be nothing that you hold on to because Jesus is my example. Praise God.
All right, here we go. Here's Paul in his last days now. He's talking he's talking because he's getting to the end of his assignment in Acts 28, verse 23 and 30 and 31. Well, um, he is in his last days, and here he's talking about, you know, he's meeting with some Jews, some Jewish leaders at that. You know, let's read in verse 28 what it says. They arranged to meet with Paul on a certain day, and he came in, they came in even larger numbers to a place where he was staying. He witnessed to them. There you go. He witnessed them. What, what he's saying? He's got to be witness talking about the cross and everything. Let's see. He witnessed to them from the morning to the evening explaining what? About the kingdom of God from the law of Moses and from the prophet he tried to persuade them about Jesus. Now, here's his two things he says. Now, from the law of Moses, you know, and from the prophet, he says, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Basically saying Jesus is the one that brought the kingdom. All right. He says, now he's telling you, like, you need to enter into this kingdom. <laughs> Basically, you know. So he had two things going on when he's talking to him because Paul is on the house arrest. He can't leave. He got no anchor bracelet. They had one back in the day, but he could not leave. They had Roman soldiers outside his place he was renting, whatever. But these Jewish leaders decided to come to his house, and he sit there and preach to them. Let's look at verse, let's skip down to verse uh, 30 in Acts 28, and it says this, for the next two years, this brother's still working. Here we go. For the next two years, Paul, living in Rome at his own expense, because he was on the house arrest, so he had to rent out a place, he welcomed all who visited him. He says, come on in. This is my crib. I'm written. Here we go. Verse 31. So what was he doing? Inviting all these people for two years. And what was he doing? He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Now you see what the Apostle Paul just did there. And in that verse, it tells you what's going on. He taught about the kingdom of God. I mean, he proclaimed the kingdom of God, and then he taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. What were you saying about the Lord Jesus Christ? It was before, you know, John the Baptist telling, you know, repent for the kingdom of God is here. You know, and Jesus was telling the disciples, like, hey, I got to go away. And they didn't understand that either. What do you mean going away, Lord? Hey, you the kingdom. What's up? You know, so, but here's Paul saying, now he could say, because Jesus has already been crucified. He was saying, you know, Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. He had to do that in order for you to enter into the kingdom. And now he had, now once you enter into the kingdom, you become part of the, I proclaim the kingdom of God upon your life once you accept the finished works of Jesus on the cross. And if you're a Jewish person, you have to say, now get rid of the old, we're under grace now, and we can accept Jesus Christ because he brought the kingdom. Now you need to step on into this stuff, all right? Praise God. Let's continue. All right, now this right here is the most exciting part of this message that I really love. Is about You would think, you know, here's, I'm going to drop you in a scenario where Jesus has already been crucified. He died, he rose again, and he came back and he has shown himself over three times to his disciples, letting them know, hey, guys, remember what I told you your assignment was. Don't forget it. Remember my teachings? What teachings would that be? The kingdom of God. He said he keeps warning them about, no, I'm, I rose again. You know, he kept back and bouncing up and disappearing. They'd be doing something. He'd just appear out of nowhere. Boo. No, I'm messing with you. <laughs> Not like that, but praise God. But I'm telling you, God is so good. So let's read this in Acts. You need to read your Bible. These are exciting stories. It's like a big movie to me. I love it. Let's go to Acts chapter 1 and 3. And, and let's see. Acts chapter 1 and 3 says this. During the 40 days after his crucifixion, 40 days later, after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time. Remember I told you that. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually still alive. You know, you, see, you know, some people still didn't get it. I mean, I guess Don Thomas says, yeah, I seen that. And a couple days later, nah, I don't know, man. I ain't never seen that happen. <laughs> That's what you praise God. But anyway, time to time again, he kept trying to say, I'm actually alive, guys. And he talked to them about what? Go ahead and say it. The kingdom of God. Even after his resurrection, even 40 days later after he had already rose, he's still talking about one thing from day one, the kingdom of God. You see how important it is? Now, I'm going to have to ask you, how many messages have you heard on the kingdom of God? See, that's the way I was. In 2006, I ran across one message that changed my life about the kingdom of God, and that's all I ever studied since. And it makes the Bible, your life, and everything fit. It makes total sense. Why do we have 33,000 denominations <laughs> that say they honor Christ and follow Christ in all different kind of formats? Because they're not 
in the kingdom. They don't understand the kingdom. They don't understand that the Bible is about a kingdom book. And right now you says, okay, it might be about the kingdom, but I still don't know what the heck the kingdom is. <laughs> don't worry. I will teach you that also. Just stay tuned with me. Let's look at this one scripture that Jesus talked about in end times when he was alive. And he talked to the disciples when he's talking about the end times. It's very, you know, famous, you know, scripture that people use when he's talking about the end times. But I'm just going to drop down to the end. And God's because they're asking them, you know, when would the end come? They had just got you shown the great temple, you know, the big building. You know how we get all excited about buildings and temples and synagogues. We love that stuff, a stained glass window. Our religion, God don't really care nothing about that. The greatest temple that he look at now, he says, you're the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's what Paul told you. Don't you not? You're the temple. I'm impressed with you. God's glory is inside you, not a building. So we don't get caught up in buildings. Praise God. That's why my ministry is not so much to have nothing against. We need a place to meet. But my main ministry is building people, not just buildings. We have to get the people trained because we perish. Even when you got those buildings, if you're not trained. Praise God. Matthew 24, 14 says this. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, all nations means ethnic groups, and then the end will come. Now you got to understand this. Here's the disciple action of Jesus because Jesus just looked at this big old temple that they was all impressed with. He's telling them like, this temple here, it ain't going to be here no more. It's going to get destroyed. And so then he started talking about some other end time events and the guy's eyes got big as a saucer and started saying, whoa, really Lord? So Lord, tell me when all this stuff is going to happen. And then he went to verse 24 and 14 and says, this gospel of the kingdom has to be preached first. And then the end will come. You know, and they start asking him, no, that's when you're going to set up the kingdom? He's like, don't you worry about all that. You're all off point. He's setting up nothing because it's already here. I just told you the kingdom of God is here. You know, he's setting it up. Praise God. Let's go to another scripture. I'm just... Okay, now we're going to find out why it was so important to Jesus that we understood and got training and teaching on the kingdom of God. Matthew 6.33 says it this way. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteous and he will give you everything you need. That's one translation. Us, you know, seek the kingdom of God first and all these things shall be added unto you. You know, so, but it's telling you, God says, here's your only two priorities. He says, seek the kingdom of God and my righteousness, and then all this stuff will be added to you. What stuff? You know, when you wake up every morning, why do you people go to work? They're trying to get their needs met, right? They got to have money. What money does? Money is exchange for a lot of services that you need. You want electricity, you want food, you want a car, you want to drive, you want a house. God says, you seek the kingdom, and my right? He says, that's just added. You don't have to work for that. That's why God's always trying to get you. That's why he said it's called the good news. The good news is you don't have to labor like that anymore. All you have to do, and I ain't saying not work. I say labor. You go to work, you don't labor, meaning you, you, it's like sweatless victory. You know what I'm saying? Everything we do is a fixed fight, saints. So you do have to work because, remember, that's the first thing he gave Adam. So everything Adam got in the garden, that's what we get. But he also got power and authority. So we get that also. That's what Jesus brought back. I'm going ahead of myself, but let's continue. So the most important statement that Jesus ever made was established was the first priority in our lives should be what? Seeking the kingdom of God. And I'm telling you, if you haven't heard, and what is the kingdom of God, how are you going to seek it? God had made that the number one priority for us. But we don't know what it is. Hey, I was the same way. I'm not, I'm not judging you. I'm just letting you know. This is how important we need to get back into our word. Back to the basics. Get in your word for yourself. God says, stop seeking all those things. Clothing and shelter. He says, for even the pagans seek after those things. You know, in our version of that, it'd be like unsaved people. You know, not seeking, seeking after those things. God said, no, even the pagan. Now, pagans were not... You know, no, no people who just just far out there. People, they was zealous people. You've seen some older movies or tribal movies where people were so they have their deities. They even praying for harvest and fertility gods. You know what do they do for that? Do they don't just say, "Well, we just believe in God that we're gonna get pregnant. We just believe in God that the heart." No, they're out there. Someone was human sacrifice. I mean, they did hours fasting, food. They was very zealous in their thing. God says that's what the pagans do. They sit around and they sit around and labor. And worry about how they're going to get all those needs met. That's why they worry about the rain. You know, God said in the kingdom, you don't worry about that. You seek the kingdom of God first, and everything will be added unto you. Now, I had a problem with that because I didn't understand it until I got deeper and deeper to study about what, what did that really mean. I heard what he said, but I didn't understand it 
and that's why I'm your teacher today. Come on, stay continue. I got more stuff for you. Okay, I know right now you're screaming at me through the screen saying, dude, come on, tell me what the kingdom of God is. I'm glad you asked that question. Let's, let's take a look at some scripture because you're not going to go to the word. Let's look at Luke chapter 13, verse 18, where Jesus talked about the parable of the soul. Let's look what he says. Then Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? How can I illustrate it? Or what can I liken it to in some version says? He's talking about what can I compare the kingdom of God? Because you remember he's talking to a people we know who used to farm and all this kind of stuff. He says, what example can I get you? I'm not going to read the example. He says, what is the kingdom of God himself? All right. The kingdom of heaven is not a religion. That's the first thing you need to come in tune with. It is not a religion. Jesus did not come down here and join a religion. He went to religious places because that's the only place he can go to get a gathering or assembly of people. He don't refer to it. He never joined any type of religion, you know, because he could not stand religion. Remember, he always had at war. As a matter of fact, religious leaders plotted against him. So the kingdom of heaven is not a religion. Let's see what the kingdom of heaven is. I give you this definition. It's a quick one, and we're going to go deeper into it in part two of the series. The kingdom of heaven is a government that belongs to an invisible country called the kingdom of heaven where God reigns and rules over that territory. It is the kingdom of heaven. This is what Jesus is so excited about. He says, repent, change your way of thinking to stop going that way. Go this way because the kingdom of heaven is now here. Why? Because it was part of the promise. Remember the promise back in Genesis where God says, I promise you, Satan, that you tricked them and made them lose the communion. Mamlaka, dominion, means kingdom, rule, reign, a sovereign rule. They lost that. And here is Jesus telling them, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's why we kept going through all the scriptures showing you how important this subject was to Jesus. Let's take a look at another thing. The country, you know, has its own values and morals and lifestyle. Now you see with all the commandments about and laws and we get caught up in religion. When we drop it down into religion, it don't make sense. But of course a country has rules. Matter of fact, I'm in America. It has rules. I can't just drive past a red light and think there won't be no consequences for it or go and take somebody's possessions. That country has rules also. This country has morals and value, but these morals and value came from... Now, this country has its own culture, <laughs> just like American culture, or other culture, European culture, whatever. Everybody country country has its own culture. It has its own values. It has its own morals. It has its own lifestyle. It even has its own language. We're going to get more than that in the part two about all the attributes and characteristics of a kingdom. But right now, I just want you to know about our values and morals come from the king, the king's nature and his desires. That's why you hear in Matthew 6, 3, 3, God says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That means his moral, his value, the way, the way he do things. You know, sometimes we put it shortly. But the kingdom of God is different from the kingdom of heaven. It's not synonymous. The kingdom of God is when you enter into this government and start operating and living in it. It's a status of being. Matter of fact, one thing they talk about in the Bible when you see all these people come to Jesus and say, hey, how can I have eternal life? They weren't talking about long life or living long. <laughs> they was talking about the kingdom. How can I enter into this type of lifestyle that you are actually displaying, living, and showing, and preaching about? And that's what the eternal life meant to them. They understood what that means when you study those out in the Greek. We're talking about how can I live long and forever and forever. No, the kingdom of God is a way of living, a type of life. Matter of fact, the woman at the well, Jesus explained the same thing. He says the water that I'm going to put inside you will spring up inside you. You'll never thirst again. That was kingdom. That was a lifestyle. He's saying, you know, God's talking about a lifestyle that he wants us to live continually and the kingdom is here now come on let's go further i got some more things i want to share with you as i close this message today now i have to remind you again if you see my other teachers we talked about isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 where it says for unto us a child is born but a son is given the government will be on his shoulders that government is what jesus came and brought it says from day that day forward he began to preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand and the government will be on his shoulders and isaiah he was already proclaiming it showing you that he prophesied that when Jesus come he's going to bring something with him he's not just going to do something he did a lot but he brought something with him and he brought something that we had already lost that's why we see these reads in front of everything repent restore redemption this is all like bring back bring back bring back from what something that you lost something that you lost 
every single thing you hear about Jesus talking about repent, redemption, restoration, redeem. You know, all these have a re in front of it. Why? Because we once had it. Adam once had it, but he lost it in the garden. This is so exciting. I'm telling you, saints, we got so much more. I know you never heard some of this stuff before, and I'm going more in depth in the teaching about it. But right now, I just want to explain in this segment about how important this message was that Jesus, you already went through. We didn't see that John the Baptist preached it, Jesus preached it, 12 disciples preached it, the 72 disciples preached it, you know, then Paul came around preaching. And don't even forget, 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, he came back, didn't talk about the cross, the blood, you know, graves, and all this other stuff that we hear. He taught the kingdom of God again. Letting them know and remind them, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget the stuff I taught you. What things did he teach you? When you go, go preaching the kingdom of God. He's talking about in John. Look at it. Look at another. Okay, before I get too excited again, let me get the word in you. Let's look at another verse. Let's look at Luke. 12 and verse 32. Luke chapter 12 verse 32 says it this way. It says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father in heaven pleases him to give you what? The kingdom of God. Here we go again. God is trying to get the kingdom of God back to his people. Back to basic training. You got to get this stuff, saints. Look at the, the, the gospel of Christ is the door. I mean, I grew up with that. I mean, you heard it. The passion of Christ does a great job of illustrating all the stuff that Jesus suffered to get to the door. He's not only just trying to get you, you know, to the door. He wants to get you through the door. That's why he says, I am the door to the kingdom. Look, let's look at John 10 and 9, what it says about that. He says, I, Jesus says, I am the door to the kingdom. I am the gateway or the sheep gate. He says, a thief comes in a different way if you don't come through that gate. Because the gate to the kingdom of God is through Jesus Christ. There is no way. That's why he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. <laughs> Thank you, God, for being all that and a bag of chips for us because we need you. We need a way. We could not restore ourselves. It took Jesus to come back, God in the flesh, to restore his people back to their original state. Genesis 1 and 2, where everything was great. You get to chapter 3, then a whole bunch of curses start and the whole world fall apart. And then Jesus started explaining through examples throughout the whole Testament about how he's going to restore his people back to this kingdom. I know you don't fully understand what all the kingdom is, but it is a government from another country. That's where you're from. You're not from this place. You're from heaven. Remember, because you came from God. And where's God from? He's from heaven. So therefore, okay, I want to give you just a little bit more scripture about what Jesus said our priority should be. But I'm going to read it in a different uh, version of the uh, scriptures this time. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 6 again, verse 30 to 33. And bear with me because I got to read this to you. But it's from the Message Bible. And the Message Bible makes it a little bit more clear. Let's read Matthew chapter 6, verse 30 and verse 33. Verse 30 goes like this. It says, if God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, because the verse before in verse 29, he's talking about how, how the lilies of the valley look so good. And it says, even in their natural state, if a man put a nice suit on, you know, he wouldn't even compare it to what God's nature and God has provided for them. So he's trying to say, this. right now we're dropping to verse 30. God's talking about the same thing. He says, now just think about that. If I did that for flowers, you know, he says, if God gives such attention in the appearance of wildflowers, much, most of which are never to ever be seen, don't you think he will attend to you? Take pride in you. Do his best for you. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, look at God trying to get us to relax, and to not to be so preoccupied with what? Getting. Ooh, that knocks out a lot. Like God says, be relaxed. I don't want you going around trying to get stuff and hurry up and get stuff. Remember, I'm talking about yoke is easy. You know, his yoke means not work, but when you work, it's sweatless victory. He says, so you're going around preoccupied with getting. I want to spend some time with you. That's why you want you doing all that. So you can respond to God's giving. Ooh, don't be preoccupied with all this getting. Be preoccupied with what God is giving. So you got to learn to receive too. You know, just not always going around thinking about, I got to get, I got to get, get, get. That's the world system. All right, let's keep on reading. People who do not know God, and the way he works fuss over these things, see? He said that's the worldly way. In the world, people go around looking and trying to meet their own needs. In the kingdom, you do not. The king is responsible for his subjects, which are not just peasants. They are king of kings. I mean, he's king of kings, meaning we're kings also. Everybody in God's kingdom are also kings and they rule and reign with him. <laughs> Praise God. I'm telling you, so excited. But you know both God 
talking about us, we know God and we know how it works. See, so therefore, steer, steer, uh, steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God's provisions. This is what we got to do. He's telling us, do this. Don't be worried about all this stuff. Do this. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. That is the message, Bob. I know it's a mouthful, but I wanted to read it to you, saints, to let you really understand how much God loves us and what he's trying to do for us, what he already has done for us. But you got to enter into this thing. Right? You ain't going to. You enter in. We're going to talk more about how you enter in, like Nicodemus, you know, like any other country, I just told you the kingdom of heaven is a country. How did I become an American citizen? Me, myself, I was born into it. So, in the kingdom of God, it's the same way. He told Nicodemus that night, you know, a Pharisee late at night, and then he says, how can I get into this kingdom you keep talking about and displaying and showing and living? He says, don't you know, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of the law. You don't even know this? He says, you got to be born again into the kingdom of God. See, we got to be born again. <laughs> Praise God. That's where the born again message come in. Again, God did not put too much emphasis on the born again message. He put all this any time effort about the kingdom because when you preach something the kingdom of God to people people are going to come to you at night hey man tell me more about this kingdom when you preach the kingdom of God more people are like man how can I like the rich friend ruler he, rich young ruler I'm sorry let me slow down the rich young ruler in the Bible came to Jesus he had money <laughs> see he, with right now the church think they promised I need more money that ain't what you need you need the kingdom <laughs> and the king, you don't have to worry about it. It's commonwealth. I know you don't understand that, but we're going to preach more about the commonwealth and the kingdom of how God take care of his people, all those who seek him. And Matthew 6, talks about seek ye first the kingdom of God and God's ways. He's like, brother, you ain't got nothing to worry about. Hey, trust me. I did this a long time ago and all my needs have been met. I am a blessed man because I am seeking the kingdom. What? First, the first priority. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that's the only thing. In his parables, he tell you, man, when a man finds the kingdom of God, man, he uh, is like a hidden treasure in the field. And then he goes and finds his treasure, and then he sells everything he can and go by the field where he hid that treasure. Mm, mm, mm. We got more of that. I'm going to get off track, so I better leave that alone. God is so good. The kingdom of God is uh, is uh, God sending his government down here to reign. Remember, don't forget, you know, the prayer. He said, teach us to pray. What did Jesus say? He says, say, thy kingdom come where? On earth. Just like what? like it is in the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> Praise God. See, he's still trying to get you the kingdom. You know, little flock, don't worry. It's God's pleasure to give you the kingdom of God. Come on. Praise God. I got a little bit more. Let's go. All right. For as long as I have ever heard the church preach, it always talk about the good news of heaven. Escapism, getting out of here, pie in the sky when you die. You know, but they never preach the good news of the kingdom of heaven. These two are not the same saints. Praise God. God never promised us heaven. But he did promise us in Genesis 1.26 that um, actually Genesis 3.15, he made a promise. He's saying that he's going to send his son and he's going to bruise your head. He's going to bruise my feet and all that kind of stuff. He's talking about returning the dominion. That means that word dominion means mamlaka in Hebrew, meaning sovereign rule. Also could be translated into kingdom. You know, so therefore God said he's promised a kingdom. We had a kingdom in the beginning. We're going to have a kingdom in the end. And Jesus came proclaiming from that day forward. His first message was repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. Meaning it's at hand. It is here. He was so excited because he's talking about the promise that Jesus did that God gave mankind in Genesis 3.15. You know, so the kingdom of heaven and the message about going to heaven is two separate things and they're not the same these two are not the same and we will revisit that's why we got to go back for more training and revisit jesus purpose his message his assignment and we're going to look into in this back to training series what god really meant by everything that you already know some of the stuff won't be New information, but it'll be new revelation about why Jesus was saying what he was saying. Praise God. It opened up my life, changed my life, saying, that's why I'm so excited to give it to you. Let's take a look at one more scripture before I let you go. Matthew 10, 7 says it like this. He says, as you go, proclaim, watch this, this message. What? Say it again. This message. What is this message? The kingdom of heaven 
is near. He's talking to his 12 disciples. He didn't even trust them to preach anything else. He says, preach this. And when the king tell you to do something, you do exactly. He say, this message, the kingdom of heaven is near as you go out. And we are disciples too, just like them. So therefore, that is our message. We must preach this message of the kingdom. I'm going to go deeper into it. I will not leave you hanging. The kingdom of God is vast. It's a country. It's like me going to Japan and realize, hey, you know you're a citizen of Japan? I'm like, whoa, I don't know nothing about Japan. I don't know his language. I don't know his laws. You know, I, I don't know none of their culture. Well, that's the way you are when you got born into a new world system called the kingdom of heaven you have to get taught this is why i got this uniform on saying let's go back to basic when i joined the military i didn't know nothing about the military i didn't know about the uniform their codes their ethics their morals their policies i had to go to basic training just to get a jump start that's what the fivefold ministry is about as i close reminding you that's what a church is supposed to have underneath one roof the assembly of other believers have some gifts among the believers and in there should be a fivefold where it says a prophet teacher evangelist you know and pastor you know, there is a big difference we're talking about the message about Jesus versus the message that Jesus preached. <laughs> Praise God. The message about Jesus is always talking about the door to where the kingdom of God. You got to walk through this door. We got to go and walk on and through this door. Don't just sit there looking at the door. Oh, what a wonderful door. Oh, how you look so door. Oh, you're golden. You're Larry Golden. Oh, you, oh, door, door, door. That's what you do. You just kind of sound like to God because that doorway, Jesus, was always supposed to walk you right into a kingdom of operation. Now you're supposed to operate in a different kingdom. That's why he says, pray that thy kingdom come on earth just like it is in heaven. When? Now, not past, not future, now. Faith is now. Remember, now faith is. Don't have me go that speech in another message. We're going to leave that one alone. Praise God. I'm your gym preacher. I am not out of message, but I am definitely out of time. <laughs> Please don't forget to go visit our website or you can subscribe to my videos on YouTube. And we also have a face page book where we got some nice, good information where it can feed your faith and starve your doubt. Praise God. Be on the lookout for the second part of Kingdom. Back to the Kingdom basic training is coming real soon. I won't leave you hanging because I know you have a lot of more questions now that you've been introduced to the Kingdom like I was. Praise God. Now, if this message has been a blessing to you, Please feel free to give a love offering to help support this ministry that we can get the kingdom of God out and a better production out for you also. Praise God. I'm Minister Hugh Braxton. I'm not always making sense, but I am definitely making faith. Be blessed. Thank you for watching another Body by Brax production from Inside Out Ministry. From Inside Out Ministry is a faith-based nonprofit organization based in the greater metropolitan area of Phoenix, Arizona. We're helping transform lives from inside out using social media network. The focus is on building people, not buildings. Welcome contributions can be made from Inside Out Ministry, P.O. Box 300, 7942 West Bell Road, Suite C5300. Again, thanks for watching another Body by Bragg's production.